Good afternoon. Welcome to This Is Your Brain. Dr. Cisse, please go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, where you are um, in the United States and beyond in the world. It is a, uh, a true pleasure to, to come here and share with you some of the new developments that we have for a disease that has um, challenged mankind and uh, really continues to, to, to challenge us. So um, I will, uh, my name is Baba Kassise. I am one of the uh, tumor surgeons here. And uh, in addition to performing surgeries, I have a basic science lab and our interest is actually in this tumor. At the end of the, uh, the talk, we'll all appreciate that this is a tumor that unfortunately uh, we surgeons cannot solely cure. We need, uh, we need help from, uh, from the neuro-oncologists, we need help from radiation, we need help from the basic scientists, um, given the, um, how difficult this disease is. Um, with that, we'll get started. So what I like to always do um, is actually go back to normal and put things in context. And um, when we talk about glioma, we talk about uh, specific cell types in the brain. When we think about the brain, we tend to think about neurons, which are the cells that do the thinking, the movement, pretty much the most important cells in the brain. But the neurons do not exist in vacuum. They need other cells that fulfill other functions that are integral to the functioning of the brain. And among these cells, as you can see, these are what are called ependymal cells. This is the ventricle, which is the area of the brain that houses CSF. These are tenocytes. And then you have what are called glial cells. And the glial cells, there are three types of them, what are called astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and uh, ependymocytes or ependymal cells. And a glioblastoma is a disease of glial cells, especially these astrocytes. What is interesting is that there are more astrocytes in the brain than neurons actually. And when these sustain certain mutations, certain changes, they basically start proliferating and give rise to, to the fatal disease that we'll be talking about. So just as a background, so glioblastoma is a tumor of glial cells. What is unfortunate is that if you look at primary brain tumors, meaning tumors that originated in the brain, this is the most common one. And unfortunately, the most malignant one and the most aggressive one. It has an incidence of 3.21 per 100,000 people. And the uh, median age of diagnosis is 64 years. So it affects the, the older age than the younger age. Although you can see it in children, it tends to be more common in men than in women. And uh, the survival is very fairly dismal. I mean, in the first year, it's about 40% of people who survive. And in the second year, you're talking about 17%. And uh, from diagnosis to um, when we lose our patients, it's about uh, 15 months on average. What is unfortunate is, as we'll see and talk about the treatments, is we can treat this and the patients will do well immediately, but we all know whether it is we, the neurosurgeons or the neuro-oncologists or the radiation oncologists, all of whom participate in the treatment of these patients, we all know that this disease is going to come back and it is universally fatal. Then a question that always comes up when we, when we talk about this, whether it is with, with the patients or their family members or our family members' friends, is what are some of the risk factors that we know can lead to development of a glioblastoma? What we know um, scientifically is that people who've had radiation in the past can develop glioblastoma. It is one of the tumors that people who've been exposed to radiation in the past um, can develop. People who have impaired immune system also, and there are some cancer syndromes that we know of, and these people definitely um, are more prone to developing um, glioblastoma. 
the question that always arises is what about cell phone use? As of now, we don't have any scientific and clinical data, solid clinical data that tells us that the use of cell phone is a risk factor for glioblastoma. Then what are the symptoms that the patients will present with? Now, I, I have to caution that these are fairly generic. It's I don't want people to think that when I have any one of these, I have glioblastoma, but this is in general how they present. And these reflect basically what can happen with this tumor. This tumor will infiltrate the brain and disrupt the normal functioning of the brain. And that can result to specific symptoms or this tumor can put pressure on the brain as well, and blood vessels, and it can irritate the brain also. And these are the things that lead to the symptoms that we can see, or sometimes it's actually, there is so much tumor that the pressure inside of the cranium is raised. And people will manifest this with headaches. Some people will present with the seizures. And some people, if the tumor is affecting an area of the brain that has to do with movement, they can present with weakness. Sometimes the tumor involves an area that has function of basically managing our language, whether it is expression or comprehension. And people, some people will present with changes in mood, personality, and cognition. And if it is affecting the areas of the brain that process visual information, people will present with some uh, visual problems as well. Loss of appetite is another thing and vomiting is um, another one. How do we go about diagnosing this? So typically we, we get an MRI and the MRI, we get it with contrast. And now it's far more advanced here, for instance, at Cornell, we have really a tumor advanced protocol that can pretty much tell us whether we are dealing with um, glioblastoma or higher grade um, tumor. Sometimes we can go to MR SPECT, which, is, which looks like some of the metabolites that can tell us that what you're looking at is actually something that is abnormal based on the readout that you're getting from it. Functional MRI becomes very important because if a tumor, as we'll see, I'll show some cases later, if the tumor is in an area of the brain that we think and we know controls language, what we want to do is we want to do functional MRI. The patient will get the MRI while the neuroradiologist is talking to them. And then we get real physiologic data as to whether the tumor is inside these areas or close. And this becomes really important for me as a neurosurgeon because before I go into the operating room, I have, a nine, I have a mental idea of where the tumor is in relation to these functional areas that we need to preserve as we'll describe later when we do this surgery. Sometimes people will have contraindications to MRI and in situations like this, we'll turn to a CT with, an, uh, with that contrast. I will show some images and we'll go over them. So this is an MRI with contrast. So this is the right side, this is the left side. And the reason is when you're looking, getting the MRI, I'm looking at you. So as I'm looking at you, your right is my left and your left is my right. And if you look at the, let's look at the normal side. So the brain is normally organized. So this is cranium, this is, lobe and this is lobe and you have a structure here that divides that divides the brain into two hemispheres and the brain is organized in beautiful mountains and valleys so this is normal brain and then here on this side you see this mass and this mass is taking up contrast and look at just here how this is white and this is a little bit darker if i pull up this this is another sequence that tells us about whether this is swelling or sometimes is actually tumor that is not as high grade as the tumor that is picking up the contrast. And this has practical implications, especially when you're doing surgery um, on these patients. So this is one case. Another case is something like this. So I, as I just mentioned, we have two hemispheres. The first one that I showed you was localized and confined to the right um, side, but this is crossing midline. 
And if I pull up the other thing, this, the, the, there is more tumor than these images I clearly show you. So all of this is a combination of tumor cells and swelling. The immune system does not like the fact that we have something here that is not supposed to be here. So it is fighting it, but at the same time, there are tumor cells that are in here as well. And uh, here's another one. This is the brain stem. So as we know, we have the brain and the brain needs to connect to the spinal cord and there is a stem of that. So all the information that comes from here goes through this. So this is a higher stake area. And as you can see, unfortunately, all of this is filled with tumor. And it is more than what this is showing us. As you can see here on this, what is called flare sequence, there is more tumor than we can actually appreciate um, here. So these are some of the things that we look for when we, when we talk about um, glioblastoma and we do the diagnosis. Now, in terms of the treatment, what I've done is I've divided it into two parts. What, what are the current modalities that we have to treat newly diagnosed glioblastoma? And what do we do when people are treated and then they come back with the recurrent glioblastoma? And these are what we do as of now. These are, these are the things that are accepted as of now as a treatment. Some of them are experimental, as we'll discuss in a second. So surgery, there is always a role for surgery, but we'll see that sometimes the role that surgery has in the treatment of glioblastoma is fairly limited because of the nature and the spread of the disease. Radiation is part of the treatment and chemotherapy. And uh, we have tumor treating electric fields as well. And uh, we have these um, glidal wafers that we can implant at the time of surgery and clinical trials. And at the end of the talk, we'll see how important these clinical trials are. So let's talk about each and every one of these and see what we can. So what are, what are the goals of surgery in glioblastoma when somebody comes to me and they have a tumor? So first and foremost, as surgeons, as doctors, you always want to preserve function. You don't want the patient to leave the operating room worse than they, uh, they came in. So maximum safe resection is the rule of thumb. And then what also is important is you know, the images that I showed you, we know based on our experience, our neuroradiologists that this is most likely this, but the definitive diagnosis will only come when we have a specimen and we send it to the pathologist. So diagnosis is also a goal of um, surgery. And uh, delaying clinical decline obviously is an important part of uh, why we go into surgery, because if you don't do anything for some of these tumors, the decline may be fast. And uh, the other thing, as you already realize, this is not a disease that only a neurosurgeon deals with, it's a team effort. And what the surgery can do is it can optimize the patient for the adjuvant therapies that they will get beyond the surgery. Improvement of quality of life is always um, a, a, a goal of anything that we do in medicine. The other thing also, as um, we will we'll talk about uh, towards the end, is when we get specimen, and this is just amazing. I mean, these patients are just amazing. They always are willing to give their tissue to the researchers, I mean, to, so that we can better understand the disease to come up with more effective therapies. So there is a role for maximum safe um, resection. There are studies that have been published that show that the more tumor you can safely take, the better it is for the patient. And there is more survival that is, that is associated um, with it. Now, maximum safe surgery in brain surgery is not easy to achieve. So one has, to have a lot of help. And uh, some of the things that we use in the operating room beyond the experience of being a neurosurgeon and having done this for a while is neuronavigation. It's basically a GPS system. Very seldom do we ever operate on these patients without using 
neural navigation, which gives you really an idea of where to make your incision, where the tumor is, and helps you intro up as well to know the extent of uh, resection. The other thing that we use is motor mapping. And I will give examples of this. If the tumor is close to the area of the brain that controls movement, you want to map. You want to make sure that you are not going to take out a piece of the brain that controls the movement of the arm and then leave the patient paralyzed. Sometimes it's not just the surface that you need to map. You actually need to find those fiber tracks that are carrying the information from the cortex, which is the processing center, to the spinal cord. So you actually need to basically map as you resect in throughout the depth to make sure that these fibers are, are, are spared. And sometimes what we do is even pre-op, we can get what is called DTI, which basically tells us where these fibers are. And that can help us. We can incorporate it in the neural navigation. So going in, we know where the critical structures are and where the channels that are carrying the critical information are also. Sometimes we do language mapping. We'll do the surgery while the patient is awake and we test all modalities with the help of our, our friends and colleagues from uh, neuropsych. And uh, now we use what is called glioline. So the patient comes in within four hours of surgery, we give them glioline. And what it does is that it tags the tumor cells. So using a specific microscope, you basically are resecting and the tumor cells will light up. So it's, 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 it's extreme, it has made life a lot, lot easier, but it is also something that can be dangerous if one is not taken into account, the fact that there is a tumor cell that's lighting up there, but that is in an area that controls either motor or language. So one has, so all of these, as you're operating, you have to incorporate the, inf the information to decide whether that millimeter of tissue has to go or not. Interop MRI is something that uh, people will use as well to decide whether you need to take more or not. With ultrasound is extremely useful. I mean, anyone who's um, dealt with um, pregnant woman, you can see how much information we can get from the ultrasound. And it is actually extremely useful in the operating room as well. And sometimes we use this Interop uh, Raman spec. And basically what it does is you can take a specimen and then pour it there. We'll send it always to pathology, but it can give you an idea of whether you're dealing with glioblastoma or not. Now let's give examples of maximal safe resection. So this is a patient, young patient in his um, 30s who came to me after he had a seizure. So here on the left side, he has an MRI with contrast. And we see this mass that is picking up um, contrast here, and we see this area that is dark. And uh, basically, this is very close to the area, or oh, if not in the area of the brain that com controls comprehension. So this is in what is called Wernicke's area. This is a young functional engineer who's with this. If anybody goes in and operate on this blindly, you can make this patient aphasic. He will never be able to understand for the rest of his life. So this is a case that I actually had to do away. So the patient comes in before we do anything, neuropsych does a complete assessment of the language. And sometimes it means if the patient is bilingual, they actually have to have an interpreter to test the other language so that we don't miss because you can damage one language and actually um, the other language is intact. So we did, we did pre-op mapping and uh, did all the testing. And then we brought him to the operating room and uh, operated on, a, on him. So as we're operating, he, they're talking to him. If they tell me he's having some errors, then I know that I'm close to areas that are, that are critical for his, uh, for his comprehension and speech. And, uh, he did well. So we, with the guidance of the language mapping while he was awake, we were able to remove all the, um, the enhancing tumor. Um, so this is really critical because if I, let, let me guess. So this, as I told you earlier, can be a tumor. So it is very tempting, especially when you give them glioline to just go and basically take all of this and really leave him 
aphasic for the rest of his life. But the awake uh, mapping, the language mapping was the thing that really helped us here. Here's another case that, um, that came to me. So a fairly large tumor that's centered on the right side. What is interesting about this is that, so the fibers that are carrying information, motor information are right here. So this is a case that I needed to do motor mapping with, and it had to be deep. As I was resecting, I could see the tumor cells, but not every cell I wanted to take because I did not want to leave him paralyzed. And that's exactly what we did. And with this, we were able to actually get over 95% of this tumor and stop when we knew it. I can get real-time information about how far away I am from these critical structures. And typically when it's over a centimeter and a half, you say, you know what, I can harm the patient. I'm not going to go any, any, any further than this. So, but sometimes this is what happens. So this is the brain stem. Uh, there is nothing that we can do to operate here and re safely resect. So what do we do in this case? What we do is we do what is called stereotactic biopsy. So we just take a specimen using a needle under guidance and give it to the pathologist and then discuss such cases at our tumor board with our colleagues and decide on radiation and chemo. So just a little bit of a background. So when we give the pathologists these um, tumors, they have to go through an algorithm that has been defined by the World Health Organization. And basically, I, I will not belabor the point, but glioblastoma is a specific entity and it has to meet criteria for the pathologist to call it glioblastoma. Now, once we're done with surgery here, as I told you, I know full well, even though the radiologists will tell us gross total resection of the enhancing tumor, we all know full well that this is infiltrated. This is diffuse. There are tumor cells beyond what I resected. So we need help. We need something else to help eliminate those tumor cells that we could not take out surgically. And that is the rationale for radiation and chemotherapy in glioblastoma. I, there was a beautiful study that was done by Stubb and his colleagues in uh, 2005 that showed that when people have radiotherapy and uh, temodora, they actually do better. But um, we're not talking about years, we're talking about two months just to tell you how, um, how, how sad this disease is. And look at this, this is from 2005, and this is still the current standard of care that we have. And uh, this is just the STU protocol that the patients will go, um, will undergo when they, uh, when they have chemo and radiation. And it always happens about four weeks after surgery because we don't want the wound to be affected and infections. So they will have six weeks when they're having both radiation and temodar, take a four week break, and then they have adjuvant um, temodar. So this is the current standard of care. Now, another thing that was approved by, um, by the FDA in 2011, I think, is tumor treating um, electric field. And this is a nice junction of physics and, uh, and biology. And basically what did this is, is that it basically damages the tumor cells and prevent them from dividing. As we all know, cancer is abnormal proliferation of cells. And by applying this, they basically prevent them from doing what they're supposed to do, this cancer tumor, tumor cell, these tumor cells. And this is what the, the, the machine looks like. So a patient will carry this, and then there is this transducer attached to a, to a battery. And there were studies that were done that showed that these actually do prolong the life of, um, of these, uh, these patients, although it is not much, but it does. And anything that we get in glioblastoma um, will take. The other thing that we do also, we can do in the operating room is basically to implant these um, wafers that has a chemotherapy agent, which is carmustine. And I will actually show a video, um, just it's one about one minute to see this. Good 
when a complete resection is performed to remove a newly diagnosed high-grade malignant glioma or recurrent glioblastoma. Microscopic tumor cells remain behind, poised to ignite a recurrence. Implantation of gliadel wafer directly into the resection cavity can extend surgical reach where most recurrences take place. Over the course of five days, gliadel wafer releases carmistine by diffusion into the surrounding brain tissue and produces a local antineoplastic effect while limiting systemic exposure. Significant dose concentrations of carmistine have been measured within five centimeters of the implant for as long as 30 days after implantation. Own the moment and complement research. So this is um, glider wafers up. Now, next, what do we have? We have clinical trials. And uh, these are really important. As I told you, what we're dealing with is a tumor that is fairly aggressive and that is universally fatal despite everything um, listed. And what clinical trials are doing are really using experimental drugs and uh, means and other methods to try to fight this disease and prolong the life of this patient. What's the rationale? Um, the point of this slide is to tell you that the MRI pictures that I showed you are fairly misleading. This is what the tumor microenvironment looks like. It's not just tumor cells, but you have normal cells. And what the tumor will do is to hijack normal cells and normal processes to its own benefit, create an environment basically that is permissive for the tumor to grow and thrive. And every single one of these cells right now is a target, is something that is being studied so that we can target the disease. So the idea behind the clinical trials is the following. So we, there are people who are studying therapies that are targeting the tumor cells. And there are people who are studying therapies that are targeting the microenvironment. Systemic therapies, even diet becomes really important. There are some critical, uh, clinical trials that have really promising data about the importance of, uh, of diet. Psychosocial support, these patients, they need it. So all of these aspects of um, the care for glioblastoma patients are being um, investigated. So when it comes to therapies that target the tumor cells, so various aspects of the lives of these tumor cells are addressed. Whether it is the cell cycle, whether it is cell death, how can we induce them basically to commit suicide, which we call apoptosis, DNA replication, their growth and migration. We know that they migrate. How can we stop that? How can we understand how they do it so that it can be um, stopped? Plasticity. So these cells can change from a state to a state. This becomes really important. So what are the driving forces and factors? Stemness, as we'll talk in a second, these tumor cells, there is a subset of them that are called tumor glioblastoma stem cells that basically cause the tumor cause recurrence and are resistant pretty much to everything that we are doing. Differentiation, can we force them to differentiate and be able not to divide like we move on to? Angiogenesis, the blood vessel, they need blood. How can we target this? So all of these aspects and more are being targeted um, to, to treat glioblastoma. For the microenvironment, immunotherapies, vaccine, oncolytic viral therapy, the extracellular matrix that these tumor cells use to travel, soluble factors that they secrete or they cause other host cells to secrete, are there things that we can use to make this tumor more sensitive to radiation? So all of these are active areas of, um, of research. Now, what about when the patients come back as they will? And this is what we have right now. Surgery, radiation, chemo, and avacin and clinical trials. Surgery still can play a role. Sometimes you'll operate on a patient three times. And uh, here's our young engineer. He came back two years later with this recurrence. He's done extremely well. Went back to work, totally normal. 
but came back with this. We did functional again. What was on his side was the fact that he was young, so his brain can rearrange. So it did functional. So I actually took him back to the operating room and did him awake again because we wanted to preserve his language. And this proved to be extremely critical. So most of the tumor, about 95% we took out, but I left this part that was very accessible that I knew was tumor. But the reason why I left it was he started having some errors. He started becoming symptomatic. So I knew that if I took this out, we would leave him harmed for the rest of his life. He's still doing well, fortunately, and we hope and pray that he continues to do well at other patients. So chemo and radiation. So Avastin is um, one thing that we use. And basically what Avastin does is it destroys these blood cells that the tumors need. The problem is that we know that it can help a little bit with the progression-free survival, but it's not a benign drug. It's not something that is um, even toler tolerated by other people and it has potential complications. But as of now, this is what we have. And then beyond, we have clinical trials, which is the future direction. So a lot of, lot of, lot of basic science and translational science is happening on the, in, in our world of uh, surgery. And those of us who do both surgery and research, I mean, it's, uh, it's just something. Uh, every single time you take out a tumor and you take it to the lab, there is something that people are learning. And people are using other models, mouse models, and other models also. On radiation, things are becoming much, much more advanced as well. Sometimes they will come up and the patients will come back with a nodular tumor that you can actually give a lot of radiation in the form of um, gamma net. Chemotherapy is an active area. So this, um, I'll close with this. And the reason why this is important is because these are the tumor cells that basically will come back. So a subset of them are called stem cells. So you can take out all the tumor, you will leave them behind, they can recreate basically the tumor. And when they recreate the tumor, they can survive and resist everything that you do. And this is ultimately what takes the, uh, the life of the patient. So they are a subset of the tumor cells, they initiate the tumor, they promote progression, resistance to therapy is due to them and recurrence they will cause. They're fairly heterogeneous and can survive in hostile environment. And they do, they act like stem cells. Unfortunately, to date, we don't have any therapy that is tailored to uh, fighting this. So this tells us that we really need more research. And there are people, really bright minds who are, who are working on, on this. Um, with that, what we need is uh, we need to better understand the disease. That's where we are. And once we have a good understanding of the disease, just like anything else we face as um, human beings, we'll probably have a better chance of treating it. We went through COVID and in no time we were able as, as, as a species to come up with vaccines and go back um, not using masks. So there is, there is hope. And, um, the, 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 the patients and their families and everyone, uh, quite frankly, is um, out to, to better understand this disease. With that, I would like to thank Dr. Stieg for, um, for inviting me and uh, having me um, share my thoughts um, on this disease, our Department of Neurosurgery and uh, uh, our medical school and um, our hospital, New York Presbyterian. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box. Uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. Oh. Oh. Yes. Hi, Dr. Cisse. There's a couple questions in the chat room. The first one, um, if you if you can see the chat, is what are some of the more promising clinical trials? 
And then a second question from John to everyone, is any room for laser interstital therapy? Oh, sorry, I, I got distracted for a second with my, with my volume. So some of the um, more um, promising clinical trials. So that's a very good question. And part of what, uh, you, everything is promising as of now, but in medicine, we basically need to see the data to say that this is promising. Every single trial that is ongoing right now is driven by a rationale. But what we are learning in GBM is that we can have a rationale, biological, physiologic, medical, and then we go after the disease and we set up a trial and then it fails for a reason we still don't understand, which is the reason why I emphasize a lot the need to better understand the disease because this is a dynamic disease. What you're seeing right now when you're taking that tissue specimen can be different from the disease that you'd be treating when the patient has had radiation and, um, and, and chemotherapy or the patient recurs. How long should one? So for the, um, for the tumor treating field, it's, it's fairly well um, standardized. And uh, you know, if anybody needs it, we can talk um, with our neuro-oncologists and then they will go over um, the protocol. Any room for, uh, for it? This is, this is a very, very good question. Um, it is something that we use in other diseases in the brain, but um, for glioblastoma, there is not much um, use of it. And remember, this it, what you're doing is you're heating and burning the tumor cells. But what we need is something that can go beyond something that is local, which is the reason why chemo and radiation actually supersede this. But it's a very good thought. about treatment outside of um, the United States that can be promising? It's a very good question. We, so, you know, outside of the, the United States, obviously a lot of um, the things that has come, I mean, Stoop was um, in, uh, in Europe before he came to, to the United States. This is a global disease. And this is where everybody contributes. So it's not just the United States, it's everyone. I mean, when we have these meetings with our colleagues, whether it is in surgery, neuro-oncology, we have colleagues from all over the world and we have collaborators from all over the world. So this is really a one world disease. So anything that comes out of China, Europe, Asia, um, or Africa, this is definitely something that will be considered and these are reviewed in scientific journals. And when they present it and when they are published, it is something that people will adapt based on the, um, on the, 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 the solidity of the data. So now I have a focus ultrasound. <laughs> Focus ultrasound. So it's a very interesting, um, very interesting thought. And actually, there are ideas that we are we are entertaining here about using focus um, ultrasound to treat um, GBM. So stay tuned, <laughs> Diane. So what what is the percentage of patients? So you know, it depends on how they present. You know, a lot of these people will do well for a, for a while but they will always come back um, with recurrence. So um, the wafers can be used both for newly diagnosed and recurrent. CED, um, so that's an, that's an excellent question. Remember that um, tumor that I showed in, um, I was in the brainstem. It's, uh, you know, CED is, has promises. But remember, the issue that we're having with CED is beyond where the drug is delivered, how much does it go beyond that? Because what you really need is you need a larger area to cover. And CED is definitely a promising um, vehicle for, um, for, for delivering. Julia, that's wonderful. Uh, we, we hope that um, he stays. 
he stays in remission for longer. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, then um, please, if you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to, to reach out. With that, I will, um, I will end. Thank you everyone for your time. <laughs>